Hiya! So in this video, we're going to be looking at empirical distributions. Uh, buckle up, because it's probably going to be a little longer video. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, it just would be very weird to cut it off in the middle. So let's just start right away. So what we're going to do in this section is look at what happens if we have empirical data, like data that's given to us from some source, and we try and create a continuous distribution out of it. In this case, think of this as I have some binomial distribution thingy, and I try to make a continuous distribution out of it. In the binomial case, it was easy to see, oh, this is just a normal distribution. Uh, but that's not always necessarily the case. So say here, for example, I have this following histogram. So I did a bunch of experiments, um, and you can kind of see, for example, the number four appeared seven times, the number six appeared three times, the number 10 appeared two times. So it's kind of an arbitrary uh, distribution but I still want to kind of make this continuous. So I'd probably plot something where it's like this or something. Uh, I guess this might come down a little faster, something like this. So this might be like the continuous distribution I have. Um, so it would be defined from, I guess, zero to 13, because obviously this needs to tail off um, at the end here and at the beginning. Um, and I want to make this as smooth as possible. So technically, we're not going to go into this class as to how to make this curve. Uh, this curve is called like a best fit curve. Um, and really, the class that studies this is numerical analysis. Um, oops, wrong color. Um, I don't know if York has a numerical analysis class. Um, but I know like I've taken numerical analysis uh, when I lived in Leeds. Um, England and it's one of, like I enjoyed that class so much um, Basically, you learn how to take all these data points and you make a nice curve out of it. It's super super fun um, Anyway side note, um, but there is a way to do this So basically what you do is you take a histogram if you haven't taken a numerical analysis class You go to a friend who has and you say yo Can you make a continuous function out of this data? They'll be like yeah, I got you um, and they'll come back with a function for you uh, the only thing you then have to stipulate or maybe tell them in advance is that PS, I need the area under the curve to be one. Remember, right? Because we need that the area has to be one to get a distribution. So they're going to give you some function. We're going to say f of x. Um, and we know that we know how to calculate the probability for um, some interval a to b. This is just a to b of f of x dx. Um, so here, this is kind of the notation I'm using, but really what I mean is um, if x represents histogram is data in histogram, uh, then what's the probability of a less than or equal to x less than or equal to b? Here, it's a little ambiguous because I don't really have a random variable because I just have data. So it's a little more ambiguous. Uh, so in this case, um, I'll be I'll be much more lenient on how we write these things um, when it comes from empirical data only. Um, now we can actually use our indicator functions to help us compute the averages of the empirical data, right? So if I were to look at this empirical data, you can kind of see well. In order to figure out the average number or something like that, I can just take each of these, sum up how many I have of them, and divide by the total number. Um, so what I can do is first I can make an indicator function. So I can look at x and say, well, if I'll make this one, if x is contained in my interval. So if x is inside this interval here, this is my a and b, um, then we'll give it a one. Otherwise, we give it a zero, otherwise. And what this gives us in a discrete sense is literally, so we take all the possible numbers and we sum over 1 over n, to n, and we sum over each of these possibilities, each of the um, xi in this case. Uh, so for example, in our case here, um, xi must be, might be 5, uh, and so we would have 4 for xi. Um, so since x, since 4 is there, um, we would keep that in. 
Um, sorry, that made no sense. Um, how do I, yeah. So basically if the, yeah, cause sometimes we might miss a number. So it's here since I'm looking at five, right? So if I say, okay, okay, rewind. I said this a little wrong. So basically what we have is some list of numbers, x1 through xn. Um, I should have put this before so I remember myself. Um, and I look at whether these numbers are in my um, empirical data. So for example, here I might have um, minus 1, 3, 6, 2, uh, 45, 4. Um, and so this one would give me a 0. This will give me a 1. This will give me a 1, this will give me a 1, this will give me a 0, and this will give me a 1. So I would get 4, because I add these up, so I get 4 out of 6 are contained in my data. Um, and so this is where this probability is kind of coming from. Like, is this going to be in our data set or not? Uh, and so basically the way to kind of do this in a probabilistic way um, is we're just keeping track of how many of our boxes actually occur. Right? We're just seeing how many times we have a box or not. Like We're not counting how high they are, we're just looking at how many boxes there are. Um, and so what this is basically saying is, well, if I look at my infinity to infinity, I just want to look at if this number exists or not. So I look at my um, indicator function, this is going to be either 0 or 1, of whether this number is here or not. Right, And basically, if you look at this, this is just keeping track of all of these numbers, right? So it's basically the same thing, but in a more continuous way. But if you look at these two together, we're basically saying something super strong. Um, it might not seem very strong at first, but if I put these next to each other, a, b, x, i, um, is approximately equal to minus infinity of infinity. And obviously here I need my n to be super large for this to work. A, B, um, so I need to choose a lot of x's. Dx. Um, so this is like approximate. Um, and so what this gives us an integral approximation uh, for averages, right? Uh, so let me kind of highlight this. For averages. Um, and basically what we want to do is just generalize this. So we generalize this to a g of x. So in other words, what we have is I have 1 over n. Instead of using um, i, I can use g of xi here. And this would then be equal to roughly this formula, g of x f of x dx. Now, at first, this might seem a little weird and be like, well, what is this useful for? But this is actually where uh, moments are going to be coming from. Uh, so moments in particular, um, we can use a discrete version. So here's our discrete thing, um, right? So this is where our um, heights are potentially coming in. Uh, but we can use a discrete formula to compute an integral. Uh, and so what we have here is uh, we can use uh, blah, blah, blah words. Uh, if I look at the moments, x to the k, uh, then we basically can just have our formulas from here. And um, x to the k is equal to minus or roughly equal to minus infinity to infinity x to the k f of x dx right so this um if you think about this this is equal to expected value of x to the k so this is kind of where we're going with this uh so the left hand side is the empirical distribution and the right hand side is the theoretical distribution uh and we write that down that way there we go. So technically, we never defined the empirical distribution. But if you want, you can read more about it um, on the wiki. So I have a little uh, note here. 
Uh, you can read more about it and how this kind of works on the wiki. It's super complicated. Um, but in essence, if k is equal to 1 and 2, we get expected value and variance. Um, like you can very easily see where this is kind of coming from, right? Um, but like, what is it useful for? Well, this is actually useful for, um, in essence, figuring out um, approximation. Or sorry, we can see how good this approximation is using um, Chebyshev's inequality. Uh, and I don't expect you to memorize this. I don't expect you to learn this technically. Um, I just expect you to know that this exists because if you look at this formula, it's disgusting. And that's why I'm kind of glossing over this section. Um, I want you to know that this stuff exists because if you're working with empirical data, you're going to need to know how to go from one thing to another, how the computers are handling things, where the errors are being formulated, um, so that you're not going to run into issues with that. Um, and so what this gives me is Chebyshev's inequality, which basically says for any epsilon greater than zero, we have this uh, formula here. So I'll put a little box on it. Um, and basically what it's saying is the difference between our two formulas. So here on the left hand side, uh, so here is our discrete version and here is our um, empirical version, it's saying that the difference between the two, the chances that it's greater than zero, greater than uh, epsilon, the chance is greater than epsilon, right? Probability gives me chance, is less than or equal to the variance of g of x divided by n times epsilon squared. So technically this gets smaller and smaller as n increases, right? The bigger the n is, the smaller this is going to get. So that's what I was saying. Like the more ends we do, the more accurate this is going to be. Um, and so, yeah, so it's basically um, these points. Um, like I said, you don't really need to know about this. You just basically need to know that this gets more and more accurate over time. Um, so you just need to know that it's true. Um, that's about it. Uh, there's more information if the book in the book if you'd like more information on it. There's also more information on Wikipedia. Um, I'm not going to cover this too too much, like I said. Um, but why do we care about this? And the main reason we care is because integration is difficult, right? Integration can be very difficult if you have a very bad formula. Um, and so since this is potentially an a difficult thing to integrate, what we can do is instead have a computer pick arbitrary number of points. And over time, if we do enough of these points, we know we're going to get something close enough to the integral. Well, if it's close enough to the integral, I don't actually, I don't care. So I, um, I don't need to calculate what this integral is. I have something that's close enough. This is what your calculator is doing. So when you sit there and plug in integration into your calculator, it's basically doing this. Well, it's using algorithms that are more sophisticated and stuff like that. But in essence, in the old days, like this is basically what they did. They just said, oh, just pick random points um, and we just need to pick 100,000 points um, and we'll be close enough to reality and just choose that. And that's basically all this is. Um, so, yeah. So this method is actually called the Monte Carlo method. Um, and it's used a lot in physics. So especially if you're a physics person, this is probably something um, you want to look into a little bit um, and study. Uh, so we'll stop here for this video. Um, I know there's probably going to be questions on this because it's super confusing. Uh, but I would say before you like ask questions, make sure to go to Wikipedia, double check, go through the book and double check uh, because I'm 100% positive the way I explain it is probably going to be not as good as other sources. Um, because I'm not a probabilist, so it's a little harder for me to explain um, this in particular. Um, so yeah, um, I will leave it at that for now. Um, and as always, if there's questions, leave it in the Monday update and I'll try to get into that a little bit. Um, so anyway, we will stop here for this video. Uh, and in the next video, we'll look at exponential distribution. So another uh, type of uh, continuous distribution. So I will see you then.